What I would like to do today, if you will allow me, is to help you understand your Bible. Because that's not an easy task. That's why God has put teachers in the body of Christ. Because a lot of people got things wrong. And that comes from not knowing the Bible. Because we can't believe anything that's not in the Bible. And in the 40 years that I've been reading and studying the Bible, and I'm also a bookaholic, I've, I've read three to five books a week most of my life. So just about anything out there on doctrine and theology, uh, you name it. I've read it. And there's a lot of mess out there. But everything, we got to take it back to the Bible. And if we take it back to the Bible, the Bible will straighten out the Bible in our minds for us. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 to begin this. I'm going to call it a, a study today. It's not... I'm going to try not to preach. I know I get to preaching, but I'm going to try not to preach so much. And I just want to teach you something. I want to teach you that which straighten the Bible out for me. I mean, the Bible, it, it's like a puzzle. And there's so many pieces. And, and you've got to have every piece in its proper place. Or you're not going to see the big picture. So it's so important that we do what this verse is going to tell us that we need to do. But of course, first, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit's help. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, Father. Father, we are un and unable, totally, Father, and insufficient, totally, Father, to, to do or in, uh, to accomplish anything without you, God. Without you, we're nothing, Father. Without you, nothing is possible. But God, with you, all things are possible. We thank you for your inspired, inerrant, infallible, pure, and preserved word today. We believe every word of it, God, and we ask you to just minister those words to our hearts today that we might understand the Bible. We pray these things in the most precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Okay, I feel ready now. Go with me. 2 Timothy chapter 2.15. 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 says this. I'm going to be turning a lot of pages. We're going to a, this is an extensive study. If I was, if I was to teach this entire subject, we could take a whole semester in seminary or Bible college. What I'm going to try to do is just hit the mountain peaks. I'm going to try to just hit the important things and try to explain this like I would explain it to a, a, a chapel full of convicts back there in the joint, you know, and make it simple. Look, I realize we have, in this day and age, we have very limited attention spans. Amen? I mean, this this media age, we're, we're, we're so programmed with instant gratification that we can't really sit still and take pay attention for very long. And I know that. So I'm going to try to do this as quick as I can. And, and if you pay attention and you follow me, and mostly if you open your heart, because I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to blow up a whole bunch of preconceived stuff. There's so many things that people think are true, and they just aren't. And there's ways that the Bible has been taught, which kind of is okay if you're going to simplify some things for like a third grade Sunday school class. But that we kind of gloss over things and, and you know, kind of make a, 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 a misrepresentation of, well, it's this and this and this. And that's okay when you're talking to little babies, right? But now as we grow up and mature in the Word of God, we need to take every word for what it says, and this is what we need to do. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are some right divisions in the word of God. And if you miss them, you're going to be ashamed 
because you're going to get some things wrong. See, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen. He is. His nature, his person does not change. He is God. But how God has dealt with man down through the ages, how he has administered his grace to mankind down through the ages has changed and has changed many times. And I'll give you an, a, just a crazy example for a division. All right. There's divisions in the word of God. We all know Old Testament and New Testament, right? I mean, there's some things that are different here and there's some things that are different here. And remember this, things that differ are not the same. Okay. Old Testament, New Testament. That's a major division. I think almost anybody would agree. Old covenant, new covenant. Almost anybody would agree with that. But now let's go back to Adam and Eve. How did God deal with Adam and Eve? He gave them one rule. That tree right there, you don't eat that tree. One rule. The only thing they had to do, believe God. Believe his word. Believe what he said and act upon it. And their acting upon it was evidence of their belief. When they acted against the word of God, that was evidence of their unbelief, and they fell into sin because they didn't believe what God said. They didn't have faith, so they fell into sin, and now they needed grace. Hallelujah. God has administered his grace through different avenues, through different techniques, through different dispensations. See, that don't get the word wrong. It's not a period of time. To dispense something is how we hand something out. So God has handed out his grace differently during the ages. Adam and Eve didn't do the same thing you and I do to get saved. Noah didn't do the same thing you and I do to get saved. The children of Israel didn't do the same thing you and I do to get saved. What do we have to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. That's for us today in this age. See, there's some right divisions in there. And if you miss the divisions and you start mixing stuff up that belongs to somebody else and start trying to put what belongs to you on somebody else, you're just going to have a mishmash and you're not going to understand your Bible. So if you'll let me today, I'm going to show you the most important division in your Bible. And it's not Old Testament and New Testament. The most important division in your Bible is between prophecy and mystery. Prophecy, all that that was revealed concerning the nation of Israel and mystery, that which was concealed and was revealed by the Apostle Paul to the church, which is his body. Well, if you can get the difference between prophecy and mystery and know what's for who and when, every single piece of the puzzle will fall into place. You won't have any pieces left on the table. You won't have any verses that seem to contradict each other. The whole picture will become clear. I promise you. I promise you, it, it was the most amazing thing that ever happened to me when I understood this division between prophecy and mystery. When I understood that everything in the Old Testament wasn't for the Christian in the age of grace. And I understood that the Christian in the age of grace has a whole different brand new program that they didn't know anything about in the Old Testament. See, so, so this is what we're going to look at. Let me read you. A really, really good quote real quick. Okay. Miles Coverdale completed the first English Bible translation in 1535. He was working with the Geneva Bible uh, uh, translators. His famous quote, he's also known for, is this. It shall greatly help ye to understand Scripture if thou mark not only 
what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, and with what circumstances, considering what goes before and what follows after. What we're talking about is context. Context, context, context. I can't stress more fervently the importance of context in understanding the Word of God. Because a text without a context is a pretext. And what's a pretext? That's an excuse. It's an excuse to believe some thought and preconceived notion that you have in your mind and you're going to try to take the scripture and try to squeeze it around and make it fit what you've already decided you want it to say in your head and listen, square peg, round hole, that don't go there. You're going to end up with a mess. You're going to end up with false doctrine. When you understand the difference between Israel and the church, every piece is going to fall into place. You're, you're not going to be confused. But when you try to mix the two up, you're going to be wrong on the coming of the Lord. You're going to be wrong on spiritual gifts. You're going to be wrong on eternal security. And on and on. Major doctrines of the Bible, you will be in error. And like I said, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you, you will be a workman that needs to be ashamed. Because the day is going to come where you stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. And you're going to realize... You had it wrong the whole time. So let's go look at what the Bible says. Not what some other teachers, uh, theologians, uh, you know, folks get stuff wrong, man. We're human. We're just flesh. We got to just trust the Bible. Okay. Let's start in the beginning. Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13 is the call of Abraham. We've already fallen in the garden. God already called Noah. Said you want to be saved, build a boat. <laughs> Noah didn't build a boat. He wouldn't have been saved. Amen. It's a different program. But it was still by faith. He believed what God said. And because he believed what God said, he built a boat and was saved. Amen. So it's still faith. It's still grace. Just administered differently. So then we get to Abraham. And God tells Abraham... In, uh, go to Genesis 13, uh, verses 14 and 16. 14 through 16. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. Here's God's promise. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, in the length thereof, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it to you. This is the Abrahamic covenant. God has told Abraham, I'm going to make a nation out of you, and I'm going to give you this holy land, this promised land, and I'm going to put you in that nation, and you're going to be there forever. That's yours for, for in perpetuity. That's a long word. It means that I'm never going to take it away from you. You, Hey, you might go stand in a corner and be on punishment for a few minutes, but in the final analysis, when it's all said and done, the promises of God are in effect. This is an unconditional covenant, an unconditional promise. Abraham and his physical seed will be in that land forever. We go to Isaac. We won't read all the scriptures because, we, like I said, we're going to try to do this while you still have some attention, and I still have some attention. Amen. I always say the 70s and 80s were a little harder on old brother Roy, so bear with me. Isaac. Genesis 26.3. Jacob, Genesis 28.13. This same unconditional covenant was repeated to 
the Abrahams, Isaac, Jacob, and on to the nation of Israel. This thing was never rescinded. This thing was never canceled because it was a eternal and a perpetual covenant with this people, with this race, with this nation, and with this land concerning their place in the literal, physical, visible realm of the heavens that God spoke into existence. This is their place in the heavens, and it's, it, it, it's for Israel. It's for Israel, forever and ever and ever. Unconditional covenant. Keep that in mind. This stuff is unconditional. So then Israel gets a king. Look with me in, uh, um, oh, I didn't write it down. Let's hope we're in the right spot. Let's go to Second Samuel chapter 7. Mm. Yeah, you might have caught me on that one. We'll see. Ah, uh, uh, second, oh yeah, yeah, all right, all right, all right, well, it ain't all, it ain't all gone yet, <laughs> amen, all right, second Samuel, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16, all right, so now, now God is reaffirming this covenant with his people and with his land to King David, and here's what he says to King David, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before times, and as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house." And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Listen. The promises of God are yea and yea. His gifts and calling is without repentance. Listen, this is not something that God's going to take back. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Listen, when God says forever, he means forever. Now, what did he say? He said, I'm going to punish you. And boy, boy, oh boy, oh boy. There was a Nazi general. And he asked, he asked a, a, one, of his, uh, one of his colonels or something he, he's, who believed the Bible. And he said, he said, why do you believe the Bible? And the man told him, the Jew. Well, if nothing else shows you that God's word is true, look at the nation of Israel throughout history. And, and wow, it's amazing. Blow your mind. But that's not the message today. Amen. So we see that God has given this covenant now to David, telling David that of his seed one will sit on the throne of Israel from Jerusalem, the throne of David from Jerusalem, ruling and reigning Israel forever. Amen? Amen. This is, this is not allegorical. This is not symbolic. When God's allegorical and symbolic, he makes that quite clear. But when God says something plain and straight and clear, watch it. Watch it when you don't believe him. Watch it. You try to make it say something else, watch it. That's dangerous ground. God will not have his word to be trifled with. Watch it. Amen. Okay. So, then we get to uh, this kingdom. This kingdom, it's in the land. It's got, it's got, the, it's got the, the seat of David sitting on the throne. And let's look at this kingdom a little bit. It was being talked about way, way back with Moses and the children of Israel when they were in the desert. Look at Exodus chapter 19 and 6. Exodus 19 and 6. 
Exodus 19.6 says this. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. So he told them all the, all the way back then that this is special people. That there was going to be a kingdom of priests. The nation of Israel, their job was to minister God to the whole world. That was their calling. That's what this kingdom was for. It was to glorify him. God made him a special people, raised them up from one man of faith, a special kingdom in whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. This was their job. They were to be a kingdom of priests. So then we get to uh, Zechariah. Zechariah 8 and 23. Zechariah 8 and 23. Start 22. Yea, talking about this kingdom. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts. Where? In Jerusalem. And to pray before the Lord. Why? Because he's sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning the world for a thousand years. Don't try to make God a liar and say he meant something else and this was just symbolic or allegorical, brother. Please, 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 for you, the sake of your own standing at the judgment seat of Christ, believe what God says. Don't call him a liar. Listen, look at verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days... In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. See, there is a time coming where that nation will be restored, where that nation will will fulfill its purpose. See, what we're talking about right now is prophecy. Prophecy, all the prophets, Old Testament prophecy, all of that, the subject of all prophecy, is this kingdom. It's the kingdom of Israel in Jerusalem with the son of David sitting on the throne, ruling and reigning, and all nations coming and bowing down before him and the nation of Israel as a kingdom of priests ministering to the whole world. All the nations being blessed in Israel. This is what is coming. This is prophecy. The subject of prophecy is the kingdom. Get that. The kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom. The literal, physical, visible kingdom on this earth with temporal blessings temporal covenants physical manifestations that is for israel that's the promise okay you're starting to get it now i can tell i can tell isaiah 61 and 6 isaiah 61 and 6 says this But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast. I mean, it's the theme, it's the theme of the whole Old Testament. The kingdom come. Kingdom come. Kingdom come. It's the theme of the whole testament. If you miss the theme of the whole thing and you try to make it about the New Testament church, you're going to be in a mess. You're going to have most of your major doctrines wrong. You've got to understand and rightly divide the difference between prophecy for Israel and the mystery of the revelation of the church of the one body, which is us. Things that differ are not the same. Amen. Let's go on. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2, more about this kingdom. Oh, thy kingdom, oh, thy kingdom, full and free. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Oh, we get to go. We get to be there too. 
We get to be there too. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 2. Oh, listen to this. This is so beautiful. And it shall come to pass in the last days, hallelujah, that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Oh, we're talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about the son of David sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And many people, verse 3, and many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, Jerusalem, to the house of the God of Jacob, the temple, and he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's God's word. That's God's promise. That's not symbolic. That's not allegorical. He ain't taking that back. He didn't lie. That's what God said. That's what's coming. Now you got the picture. The entire Old Testament, the theme is the kingdom coming. Kingdom come. It's about a king and a kingdom. It's about a king and a kingdom. Okay, so now we get to the we get to the what we call the New Testament. Brother, it's deceptive to do that because when we get to Matthew, Mark, and Luke specifically, and John, John, John's a little, that's another study, but John has more of our covenant in it because John wrote his stuff after the full revelation of the church was given to the Apostle Paul. So when John sat down and wrote, he had all the Pauline epistles. He had all Paul's books before him. So oh, the whole church thing was very clear to John. And that's why you see the church so clearly in the book of John. But when Matthew, Mark, and Luke, back, back, back when they were writing, these are in the early days of the church. And they didn't have as much light right then. So, and we see, and that's not the subject. Their, their subject was Messiah coming on the scene and fulfilling Old Testament prophecy concerning the nation of Israel. So we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see Christ coming as the Messiah and the King of Israel. So John the Baptist, go to Matthew uh, chapter 3. See, we haven't got to a spiritual kingdom yet. We're still talking about a physical, literal visible kingdom promised to Israel. Don't back read scripture. Don't run ahead and get stuff that hasn't been revealed yet and try to stick it back where it doesn't go. That, that hasn't happened yet. That hasn't been revealed yet. Just, just pay attention to the immediate context and what's gone before. So you can't, you can't say, well, they mean this, but that hasn't been revealed yet. It, it may exist, but it hasn't been revealed. They didn't know it. That's not what they were talking about. Amen? Okay, let's look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. John the Baptist. Okay? So what happened? He says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. Amen? The king is coming for his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, that's, that's, all, that's all the nation of Israel knew. Was this physical, literal, visible kingdom? They knew that Messiah was coming. They knew the Son of David was coming. They knew he would sit on the throne in, in Jerusalem. We just read everything that was promised to them in the prophets. They knew that. They were waiting for that. They expected that. And John the Baptist says, Hey, folks, it's kingdom time. He's coming. I'm here. I'm here to get ready for him. Right? So 
Israel is looking for the kingdom. Hallelujah. And well, the, the Gentiles and the Romans and oh, you go back to the, the, the Greeks and the Persians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians, they, the Egyptians. Man, Israel's being getting attacked and because of their sin, their chastening, because of their disobedience, they, they've been getting whooped on by everybody. They've been under oppression ever since the days of Solomon. And I mean, they're, they're in a mess and there's like, oh man, finally Messiah's coming and we're going to rise up. We're going to be the, the head and not the tail. We're going to rule and reign with him over the earth. We're going to be that kingdom of, 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 of priests to the world. And, and this is, that's our time. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. That's what John the Baptist says. And then, so then when, so then when Jesus begins his ministry, and just go to verse 17. Matthew 3 and 17. Okay, I'm on the wrong spot. Uh, oh, 417, 417. Amen. Got me on that one. All right, 417. Here's what Jesus, here's what Jesus is message was from that time jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand the kingdom of heaven is at hand here i am i'm the son of david i'm here to take my throne the kingdom of heaven is at hand this promised kingdom to the nation of israel is it is at hand all right. Well, we know that that didn't happen. And we know that didn't happen because the nation of Israel, as represented by its high priests and its rulers, they rejected him. They didn't just reject him. They murdered him. See? So, Jesus Christ dies but he raises again the third day and when he was on the cross he prayed a prayer and we know the father always always hears his prayers and when he was hanging on that cross he prayed a prayer and he said this he said father forgive them they know not what they do that prayer was answered where was that prayer answered look at Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost Acts chapter 2 start in verse 22 the apostle Peter stands up he's surrounded it's the feast of pentecost all jews have to come to jerusalem for these three feasts a year as part of their jewish religion and this feast is the feast of pentecost so all jews from all over the world had come to jerusalem to celebrate the feast of pentecost as they were commanded to do and peter stands up boom he the holy spirit had just come like Jesus says, I must go away and I will send another comforter. If I don't go away, he won't come. But I go away, I will send him even the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive. See, so he goes and he sends the comforter. He sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes down on the day of Pentecost. And in that time and in that moment, the finished work of Calvary's cross was applied to the believers and the believers were born again the believers were regenerated this is the birth of the church this is the beginning of something brand new oh they didn't know all about it right then and there but that was going to be revealed by paul in short order but what they didn't even realize happened the church was born right here at the day of pentecost and as he stands up filled with the holy spirit Here's what Peter says to all the Jews gathered for the feast. Verse 22. Ye men of Israel. 
When something's addressed to somebody in the Bible, pay attention to that. Pay attention to that. We can learn from it that it wasn't written specifically to us. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised from the dead, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of them. And look down at verse 30. Therefore being a prophet, and this is what we're talking about David now. Therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, according to the flesh, we're still talking about physical, visible, literal, kingdom, king, on the throne, in Jerusalem, that out of the, according to his, the, to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. So Israel is getting another chance. God is answering the prayer of Jesus. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Peter stands up and he says, you men of Israel, you killed your king. You killed your king. And they say, what should we do? He says, repent, be baptized, and you'll be forgiven. For what? For killing your king. This was a right to Israel. Right then, they got a chance. And the common people did, thousands of them. The common people did, thousands of them. And they became the nexus and the heart of the New Testament church. Those that did believe. But not the nation, brother. Not the nation. Not the rulers of the people and the high priests. Not them. No, no. What happened? Uh, uh, well, let's, let's look at uh, Peter's sermon the next day. Peter's sermon might not have been the next day. Shortly thereafter. It's his next sermon anyway. His next sermon is in Acts chapter, chapter uh, uh, 3. And he's telling them, verse 17... Uh, and now, brethren, I want that through ignorance you did it, as did your rulers, but those things which God before has showed by the mouth of his all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. See, we're still t we're still in the realm of prophecy. We're still in that which was revealed to the nation of Israel through the prophets. We're still in prophecy. Prophecy is what? Is that which has been revealed. What is mystery? That which has not been revealed yet, okay? So that which is hidden, all right? But we're still dealing with what has been revealed, and that is prophecy to the nation of Israel. All right, so he says, uh, verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When? When will their sins be blotted out? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When Jesus comes back and sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem and the kingdom is established, all Israel will be redeemed and healed. You don't believe it? What do you say in verse 20? And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached to you, uh, which was before preached unto you. When, when you're going to, when, when's Israel going to be forgiven? Huh? When, when the presence of the Lord comes, when he sends Jesus, amen? And listen, God knew they weren't going to do it, but the offer was valid, and had the nation of Israel fully and completely repented, the high priests and the rulers, and received him, uh, it would have been a whole different story. But that's another lesson. All right. Look at verse 21. He's going to, he said, verse 20, he'll send Jesus, verse 21, whom what? Whom the heavens must receive until the time of the restitution of all things. What's the time of the restitution of all things? <laughs> when the kingdom is established 
and Christ is sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So Jesus is going to be gone. When he returns, it's it's kingdom time. The lamb is going to lay down with the lion. Much of the curse will be refused. The man's not going to learn war anymore. Uh, the, uh, uh, people, uh, if a man dies in a hundred, he'll be like, oh, he was just a baby. These are kingdom prophecies. This is kingdom time. And that starts when he comes. And they said, Israel, if you'll repent, he'll send him right now. He'll send him right now. He'll send Jesus. The heaven's got to hold him till the time of restitution of all things. Which God is, verse 21, whom the heavens must receive and, until the time of restitution of all things, what which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Prophecy to Israel. Hey, put the right peg in the right hole, and the whole Bible, it'll just, it'll just open up. There'll be no missing pieces. Nothing will contradict itself. Everything will make sense if you just apply Scripture where Scripture goes. Amen? Context determines content. Context determines content. All right. Now, they have the offer. And the rulers and the priests... They give their response to the offer over in Acts chapter 6 and 7. And they give their answer to a deacon named Stephen. Look with me over in 6 and 7. Here we go. Chapter 6 verse 8. And Stephen full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Hallelujah. <laughs> Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and they caught him and they brought him to the council. The high council of the Sanhedrin, the rulers of the nation of Israel, those that could speak the final word of rejecting or receiving Messiah. It says that I, and all in verse 15, and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And boy, Stephen preaches one of the most awesome, awesome sermons right now. It goes on for the whole chapter. It's long. It's the whole it's the whole history of the nation of Israel. It's a whole summation of this prophecy, this prophetic program, everything concerning the king and the kingdom to the nation of Israel. He preaches that whole thing and he gets to the end. He gets to the end. Ooh, and he does not finish with love. Amen. All right. What, how, did, how does he finish? Get to uh, 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 chapter 7, verse 51 and 56. 51 through 56. All right. Here's, a, here's Stephen's mild, gentle, loving presentation of the gospel. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hardened ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed upon him with their teeth. Ah! But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly unto heaven, saw the glory of God and what? Oh boy, don't miss it. Don't miss it. And Jesus standing 
on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Where have you ever, ever, ever before in the Scripture seen Jesus Christ anything but seated at the right hand of the Father? Why was he standing? Oh, somebody said, well, Jesus stood up for Stephen because Stephen stood up for Jesus. And that's cute, and that's, and that's true in a sense. But no, he was standing because of what Peter had just said, that if they would receive him, that, they, that God would send Jesus, and he would set up the time of the restitution of all things, the king and the kingdom to Jerusalem. Man, this, this stuff all fits together just perfect. If you believe it, if you believe what the Bible says, if you get rid of your preconceived oversimplifications and just believe what the word of God says and follow the story and put everything in context, you don't have a you don't have a single missing piece left on the table. There's not two verses anywhere that even seem to contradict each other when you put everything in the right place and you rightly divide the word of God. So they kill him, they kill Stephen, they stone him. <laughs> but in verse fifty eight, somebody else was there. Verse 58. Look at verse 58. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul who we know as the Apostle Paul. With Israel's answer to God's offer of a second chance for Jesus to come and establish the kingdom now, with Israel's rejection of the offer, God gets ready. Hallelujah, I'm so glad he did. God gets ready to go in a different direction. Oh, this, is, this gets good. This gets good. All right. So now, now we go come out of the realm of prophecy concerning Israel and their kingdom. Now we're going to move in uncharted ground. We're going to move in unknown matters. We're going to move in mystery, because what's mystery? Mystery is that which has not yet been revealed. Oh, but we're going to get some revelation now. Now God is going to begin to use one man, just like he used Moses, for the nation of Israel to deliver his message to them, God is going to call one man, the Moses of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, to deliver the revelation of the gospel of grace and the church and everything concerned with the mystery of the one body of the church, the universal church of God. He's going to deliver all of that through the Apostle Paul, the most unlikely of men. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So, Paul talks about that. Uh, look with me in Galatians chapter 1. Apostle Paul has an experience on the Damascus Road. Jesus Christ personally appears to him, calls him as a minister, tells him he's going to send him to the Gentiles and, and going to save the whole world. Going to save the whole world. Everybody, it ain't just about Israel anymore. We're going to save the whole world. Paul, and, I, and, I, and you're the guy, you're the guy I'm going to do it through. Oh, it ain't going to be pretty, though, because, oh, Paul went through it. You're talking about suffering for Christ? I doubt anybody's ever suffered for Christ the way Apostle Paul did. But brother was faithful, and he stayed on his mission, and he wrote so much of the New Testament. He gave us the revelation of the gospel of grace. We owe a lot to the Apostle Paul. Amen. But this is when he got it. Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 11 and 12. Here's what Paul says. He said, but I certify you, brethren. I certify this. Man, this is, I, I'm putting something on this, man. This is lock solid. This, this, you can, you can, you can bet your life on this. I certify this. He says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, 
but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ appeared to the Apostle Paul. Jesus, Paul didn't go get this from, from the apostles in Jerusalem. Paul didn't get this out of the Old Testament. Paul didn't get this from anywhere but personal revelation from the risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ. And he downloaded to Paul the gospel of the grace of God. Look in uh, chapter 2. Same book, Galatians. Uh, verse 1 and 2. Then, this is 14 years later. And uh, Paul, he says, I, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, took Titus with me also, verse 1, chapter 2. He said, I went up by revelation. See? He's given them a revelation. When you re He's revealing something. That's what you do with the mystery. You reveal it. Because what's a mystery? That which has not yet been revealed. So he goes up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should or had run in vain. <laughs> Paul goes up to Jerusalem to the leaders of the church. <laughs> we're talking Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We're talking, not Luke, Luke wasn't there yet. Matthew, but maybe he was. But Matthew, Mark, John, we're talking about the 12 apostles. And the, and the church in Jerusalem and all the thousands that were saved on the day of Pentecost. Man, th this thing is going on. you got those guys that, that walked with Christ for, for three years. And, and I mean, they, they this is going on in Jerusalem. These are the pillars and the leaders of the church. And, and Paul steps in and look, he don't put them on blast in front of everybody. He calls them off to the side and says, come here. You know, I don't want to embarrass you, but whoop de whoop this is what God's doing now. This is a new program. Y'all need to get your message straight. I'm giving you revelation here. That's what happened. <laughs> and uh, so, you see in verse 9, and when James, Cephas, that's Peter, when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, <laughs> perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So, Paul is given the revelation of the gospel of grace. And he says that Christ is the end of the law to everyone that believes. He's coming to bring the good news the salvation is no longer through an organization because that's what the nation of Israel was. That is what all the prophetic scripture and the Old Testament were about. They were. It was about an organization on earth. Paul has come to reveal the mystery of not an organization, but an organism, a living organism, which is the body of Christ which is the church of the living God, which is all those believers who have been born again by the Spirit of God, who are indwelt by the Spirit of God, who are united in one body, the head seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. This is a new thing. This is a revelation. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Nobody ever knew about this before. The apostles didn't know about this. They didn't know about it when Jesus was walking the earth. This is brand new stuff that the Apostle Paul kept. This is the revelation of the mystery. The revelation of the mystery. See, now, when you get things straight concerning the mystery and the church, and you don't mix them up with the kingdom and Israel, all of Scripture is every piece is going to fit perfect. There will be no contradictions. It will all make sense. I absolute promise you. Absolute, absolute promise you, if you will receive it. So here's what Paul says about the revelation of this mystery. Now, now it's going to get good. Now it's going to get good. If it wasn't good already, it's getting gooder now. All right, here we go. Let's look at uh, uh, Ephesians chapter three. Ooh, pay attention now. Well, I hope you. I hope some people didn't didn't turn this off and go away before we got here, because this is the icing on the cake. This is this is this is where you do your Snoopy happy dance. This is where you get in our shouting ground. This is where you say hallelujah. This is where you raise your hands. This is where the joy of the Lord bubbles up. Amen. Oh, boy, I said I wasn't gonna preach. Here we go. All right, let's let's get back to teaching. All right, here we go. Amen. Ephesians chapter three. 
Oh, look at verse 1 through 9. Look at verse 1 through 9. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you heard of the dispensation, hello, of the grace of God, which is given to me, to you word. If you heard about this new dispensation that was revealed to me to give to you, hallelujah. If you heard about it, <laughs> have you heard about it? <laughs> how, look at verse 3. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, the mystery, right? As I wrote afore in few words, oh, it's all over in the Pauline epistles. It's all over. The revelation of the mystery. Amen. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Oh, look at verse 5. Which in other ages, in other ages, was not made known, was not made known, hallelujah, to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Hallelujah. <laughs> Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am the less than the least of all saints in this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And now, go, don't miss verse 9. Don't miss verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid Hid in God. It was hid in God. It was not made known. It was a mystery. It's just now being revealed. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Romans 16.25 Well, if one ain't enough for you, let me hit you with a couple more. Romans 16 and 25 and let me grab something to wipe to wipe this off my forehead real fast. That's summer's in Las Vegas, by the way. Okay. Romans chapter 16. Verse 25. Let's start 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him. It is of power to establish you according to my gospel, Paul says. He has the power to establish you, Paul says, to my gospel. Amen. This is the newly revealed gospel of the grace of God, not the message of the kingdom. Amen. Things that differ are not the same. Amen. He says, Who is according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to what? The revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. This is new stuff. This is not about an organization on earth. This is about an organism in the heavenlies, brother. This is a whole thing that's completely different, that was not known. It was hid. This is brand new stuff. Verse 26, but now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Hallelujah. This is some brand new stuff. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. Oh, this is good stuff. Oh, let's start. Let's start at 25. Here's that word again. Why people, why people hate this word? Why people, why people got a problem with dispensational theology? I have no, dispensation is a Bible word. Dispensation is a biblical concept. Let's listen to Paul. Where well, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even what? What is that dispensation? Even the mystery.
mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now manifested to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of 